Hey there. This is your Total Connector, the Total Connector. My name is Kevin Davani. I'm really excited to have Ben Perrin of BTC Sessions on. Uh, I've been waiting for this interview for a long time because I met him actually at, uh, at the Bitcoin conference in Riga um, many months ago. And um, yeah, and I wanted you know to go down the rabbit hole with him, pick his brain on because he's I think he's one of the you know best educators um, in this uh, Bitcoin space when it comes to you know technical jargon, you know breaking down the language, uh, onboarding Bitcoin beginners, uh, newbies. Uh, he has a really uh, deep understanding of monetary properties, uh, scarcity, uh, principles of Austrian economics. You know he understands a bigger picture. So yeah, so I hope you're gonna love this as much as I will. And uh, let me know what you think. Let me know your questions. And uh, thank you so much for support and for listening. And uh, yeah, um, I'll see you soon again. Bye. Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Davani. My very special guest is Ben Perrin of this awesome and really amazing educational uh, video, uh, educational tools, um, um, BTC sessions. Ben, thank you so much for coming on my show for the first time. Yeah, thanks for having me. We're really happy to be here. <laughs> You're from Calgary, right? From Canada? Yeah, that's right. Calgary, Canada, out in the mountains. It's cold here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The same here in Vienna, Austria. Uh, so, Ben, um, it's amazing. I mean, uh, you know why I find your, your videos uh, uh, not only, you know, infotaining, as I would say, but also <laughs> it, it, uh, it makes sort of a easy impression like it's everything is easy you know you, you i mean i know it's it's complex you know the technical stuff uh, with its hardware wallet full note uh, but you explain it in a way uh where in my perception it's like it's it's really easy you just have to, you know to sit down take your time and 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 dig a little bit deeper into the rabbit hole <laughs> let me ask you first um when when you uh, you're, you know, I see you as an educator and onboarder of, of, of Bitcoin beginners. Mm -hmm. What is it? Um, because I met you, I remember I met you at, at Riga conference, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. It was really good talking to you and, and you asked the right questions. You know, you asked uh, all those Bitcoin experts, you asked them like, what are the, the you know, so, so, something like that, some, what are the essential um, misconceptions about Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. What is what? What do you perceive are the like the the fears the the, the uh, when it comes to curiosity, open mindedness, the worries, the concerns people have? What do you what do you think are the misconceptions of people? Uh, I mean, there's a lot. So so I mean, it depends if they're if they're interested or or not or or hesitant. There's a spectrum of people, right? There's the ones that. Um, you might refer to as no coiners where they're like, oh, it's absolute trash. And, and a lot of their m misconceptions are around, oh, well, anybody can just make any, any like more coins that they want. They can just create all the Bitcoin in the world. Anybody can make Bitcoin. It, you can hack it in a second. Just like the basic fundamentals of, of uh, the antithesis of what Bitcoin solved. Um, so they just think, they haven't even dug deep enough to understand that Bitcoin has solved those problems of digital scarcity. Um, then there's the people that are, are just very unsure. They don't know even what a wallet is, how it functions. Um, the basics of that a wallet actually does not hold any money. It's rather just, just a, a, a private key, a key to your money um, that allows you to move it. Uh, so there's there's those people that are just hesitant to even get started. And I find those people the, the easiest to deal with because once they've done it, they go, oh, that, that actually wasn't too bad. And once you can break down just those very basic beginner steps of Oh, I, you know, th this is what a wallet is and this is how you should think of it. It's, it's like having a key. And if somebody makes a copy of that key or steals that key, gains access to it, then they can move your money. So just protect your key. You're good. Um, getting past that is, is usually fine. And then there's people that are into Bitcoin and get the basics that, okay, you have digital scarcity. They kind of start to understand the sound money aspects of it. But then the devil's in the details where uh, you have, I, I won't name names, but everybody's going to know who I'm talking about. You have certain 
OG Bitcoiners that that made promises that didn't line up with how the technology actually functions. It's it's instant and free. And we've learned over time that's not the case. We can achieve uh, close to that with secondary layers, but if we want to maintain uh, absolute digital, digital scarcity, censorship resistance, the ability of anybody to audit the chain, then we've got to we've got to keep certain qualities to the base layer of Bitcoin, which makes it not instant and not free. Um, and so, I think uh, there there can be levels of misconceptions, and it really just depends who you're talking to. Great, great. Totally agree with you. Um, when do you think, do, would you agree with me? It's uh, we are far away from critical adoption. I'm not, you know, I'm not talking about mass adoption, but when I, when I, you know, teach whatever friends or whatever age group they, they are, you know, whether they're 30, 40 or 60, 65, it's, I mean, it already starts with a harder wallet, you know, with it's a, whatever, a treasure or a ledger or whatever, but, but I, they call me like, um, uh, so many times afterwards, after I explain it to them, uh, you know, and it, 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 it's really not easy, like updating the, the treasure by itself. You know, you got to take care of all these like steps in between. Um, and I'm not even, you know, shamefully, I must admit, I don't even have a full note yet, uh, you know, so, um, so it's okay, you know, uh, but what I'm, first of all, let me ask you, um, do you think it, um, aren't you sometimes surprised or baffled that we don't have more competition in the product market of hardware wallet and full notes? Like for example, whatever that is, Ledger, Trezor, Casa with the full note plug and play, uh, because it's already mainstream. It's been talked about, you know, we got this study of the Deutsche Bank <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, talking about the multi-trillion dollar question. What, what is, what is missing here? Um, uh, it's, I honestly, I think it's time. I think people, um, they underestimate how long it takes to get to that critical mass where it starts snowballing. I think we might be on the cusp of that, but like that. So I, I like to refer to, and I might mix up a few of the finer details here, but I like to refer to other exponential information technology. So, so one of the instances would be the human genome project where they're trying to map the human genome. And it was taking years and years just to map to 1% of the human genome. And they were like, oh, it's going to take decades and decades. It's going to be hundreds of years before we get this finished. And at 1%, every, uh, a few people were saying, no, we're almost done. Um, because it, it starts to, the technology starts to double after a while and, and they start to understand it better. Um, and and it was true. Like it took from the point of one percent, I think it was like an extra seven years before they mapped the entire human genome. Um, and and so I think it's going to get to that point soon. So the initial uh, the initial chunk of okay, we're laying out the base layer infrastructure. Like uh, the Bitcoin base layer hasn't even ossified yet, right? Mm -hmm. there, we're still making incremental changes and optimizations to it, and we're just Lightning Network just launched in March of 2018. And I mean, the progress there has been incredible because when I tried it in March of 2018, it was, it, I mean, it was difficult. Uh, it still is difficult in a way, depending on how you do it. Um, but as this stuff starts to move quicker and quicker, um, it, it will be... I think that everybody's been uh, toting the line slowly and then all at once. Mm -hmm. uh, or so. <laughs> but it's, it, it does. It's that initial speed bump to get over and then you just start snowballing. And so um, I think uh, a number of things need to happen. Of course, uh, wallets can always get easier. The, the tricky part about it is, is we're trying to make this as trust minimized as possible because that's the ethos of bitcoin but trust trust minimized requires knowledge and it requires action on the part of the user and so what roads do we go down of course there's going to be people that default to the easiest answer so that means unfortunately custodians and, or custodial lightning wallets uh, or instances where software gets auto updated uh, for your hardware mm -hmm. that 
um, you don't verify yourself. There are going to be people that utilize stuff like that. I think the important thing is, even though not everybody will do it, that we push for everybody to be as trust minimized as possible. Push for people to run full nodes and secure their own keys and, and you know, proof of keys, get your keys off exchanges. Even just that is a step above, I'm just gonna leave my money with somebody and always trust that it will be there. Um, so I, I think, uh, I definitely appreciate the hardline Bitcoiners. I think that's very important because that ensures a critical mass of people are doing the hard work of ensuring the integrity of the system but we also do have to step back and realize that there will be people that don't partake in running nodes that don't uh even hold their own coins in and own their own keys in some instances and uh while that's not desirable um it will happen and as long as we keep pushing for as many people as possible to be in full control of their monetary sovereignty, then, then that's just the way it's going to be. And I think um, we will see it move quicker and quicker over time. I mean, we're a decade in uh, and leaps and bounds, man. Like when I got, when I started playing around 2014, <laughs> I, I downloaded Bitcoin QT. It took like two, two and a half, three days to sync before I could like execute a transaction. Uh, Apple had just banned Bitcoin wallets from the app store. Uh, you know, we've come a long way. So, and like running a node was, yeah, it was, it, you know, basically Bitcoin QT. Now you've got plug and play options. If you want to do that, you've got multiple hardware wallet options. There are, I will say there is a lot of attempted competition in the hardware wallet space. Uh, but you just see the big ones that kind of stick out to me, like Trezor and Ledger are, have the benefit of being around forever. But and then Bitbox, I think, came in the market. Uh, yeah, yeah. Crypto security, whatever it's called, Bitbox. Yeah. I think you know they're doing a pretty good job. I think when it comes to yeah. security and like you know checking themselves and, and checking other products, so it's good. Yeah. You know that people are watching each other's back sort of yeah exactly like shift crypto seems to be doing a pretty good job and then of course like any any hardcore bitcoiner is going to be pretty pro cold card uh so yeah. yeah yeah so there i mean there are more and more options coming up and it's nice to see some of them start to go to the forefront where uh they're they're able to compete with uh people like trezor and ledger um and and maybe even uh, take it take a crown here and there so <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I do think it's, it's heading the right direction, but I think the OGs that have been here for a long time are going, man, this has taken a while. Um, and, and they have expectations of it happening sooner rather than later. But I, th I think many are starting to come into the mindset like, Hey, low time preference and it'll happen when it's happened happening. And in the meantime, I'm just going to stack some sats. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, it's yeah. it's uh, you as you say. You know, we are on the precipice on every level. Even when it comes to understanding, like opening up, understanding, asking the right questions. What is money? Where does money come from? And this is, I mean, thanks to whatever Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto vision, it's like for the first time we're asking ourselves. So I'm asking myself. You know, like I, I came here like maybe three years into this whole space, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm like, when did we ever ever learn anything about uh, you know money, let alone any kind of principles of any Austrian economist in school, even, you know, economists tell, tell us that, right? Professors or doctors or whatever, the students, they're, they're like, maybe we've had, you know, a, few, a couple of hours at the university. I, I don't have an economic background. I studied law, but I know from other people, you know, maybe they heard something about Hayek, but that's it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that, that's, that's really something that, um, that changes, transforms this whole space, uh, you know, in totality. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I think um, the the interesting thing about this is you're not taught it in school, um, but I think uh, that is is it's been largely the the reason that a lot of people aren't privy to this kind of information is yes, of course, that there's a lack of education in the school system, but also there's been no free market comparison as of late. I mean, like how many young people all own gold or, or have easy access to gold because it's, it's not a viable um, 
al currency alternative that's available to everybody. Um, you know, as far as like onboarding and, and being easy and digital for like the digital information age. And so now all of a sudden you're, you're faced with an instance where there's the, what we're taught in school, the like Keynesian economic school of thought. And, and now there's a direct free market comparison that over the next number of decades is going to be in your face. And uh, like we've got, we've got, and I, this is where I think it'll be interesting. We've got instances where uh, people have kind of horned in on a market that will start to get people asking questions. And I'm talking about people like uh, Lolly and Fold that are doing sats back. And so what this will do is it's going to get people that think they're just getting points back, cash back for, for uh, uh, making purchases. Um, but what they're going to end up seeing is one day they're going to look and their sats back are, are going to be worth like twice as much and you're going to be able to get way more than you thought you were. And you're going to go, what, what the hell? Why are my, my points worth more? Why can I get like 17 gift cards with this? And, and then people are going to start to ask us, well, what is this? What are, what are sats? Why, why do I have this? Um, why is it fluctuating in value? And this is going to lead them down that rabbit hole of, well, it's money, but it's not being printed in perpetuity by a central bank. Um, it's, it's funny. We, we get so minimal, especially if you don't study in university, you basically get no education on how money works. Um, I saw something the other day, uh, cause my, my daughter's really young and, and we have Disney plus. And so there's a little like Pixar short on what is money. And I was like, Oh, cool. And I tapped on it. It was like three minutes long. The first minute and a half is like them just joking around. Uh, and then they, their explanation is basically money is printed by the federal reserve and can be used to buy things. And I looked at, it, I was like, man, that was pretty vague. And then I was like, but th that's basically what I learned in school. That was it. That, that sentence and a half was, was the, the most you get from, uh, you know, up to high school <laughs> when it comes to money. Um, and I think it does a huge disservice to the general population to, to not know those, those basic uh, building blocks of how does money function? And then furthermore, how do you utilize money to not end up in a, 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 a funnel of debt? Um, and, and it's just not something that some you learn. And since getting into Bitcoin, it's completely shifted my entire mindset to actually caring about money and how it's created, but also caring about how I handle money on a personal level. Um, it, for the first time in my life, since I got into Bitcoin, I started saving money. I was terrible at saving money. I did not learn well uh, as a kid. And now, now I'm, I'm a saver and I put money away and I, I value, I think about how I spend my time and how that time is converted into uh, value that can be redeemed at a later time. And where do I want, do I want to store that in something that's going to gradually disintegrate in front of my eyes? Or do I want to so store it in something that's going to be bolstered and, and further secured and, and gain in purchasing power over time? And, and as you start to learn it, it, I kind of feel like it's a no brainer, but just not enough people have been exposed to it yet. So it, it'll be interesting to see the change in mindset uh, from absolute consumerism in the coming decades to hey maybe let's be a little bit more thoughtful thoughtful about what we do with our money and what money we use yeah I totally i totally agree with you because it, it really it changes not only mine but so many other people's fundamental way of thinking uh from you know a high time preference consumerism you know because when we did, did we ever had the opportunity the chance to save money to whatever you know it's it's like it's been like uh, stigmatized like you know hoarding saving you know all these stories mm -hmm. and 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 even tales like oh the the greedy old man uh, I think it was, wasn't there like Christmas Carol or something like that, dark about duck, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> hoarding money as if it's something like really bad. But on the, but people, I think we, we have, a, I still have to wait a long way to go till we understand what is possible with Bitcoin. 
with this heart, with this pure and absolute total scarcity that's never been done before. I mean, what kind of circle economies first in the beginning phase and then, you know, the bigger on the grander scale, this huge, uh, you know, um, uh, prosperous, a really entrepreneurial long-term investment economy is going to evolve mm -hmm. out of that and from out of that you know everything else you know which which then eventually will should and will serve humanity with it be you know technological patents that's been suppressed mm -hmm. and you know i mean because yeah. this is what i want to ask you i mean when you came on your path towards bitcoin you 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 know finally got it Besides like the monetary problem, you know, finally okay, we, we, we understood and I hear that a lot, like money, like even the universities, I, I was in some, doing some talks and like some, some lectures, so, oh, money, is just a social construct, you know, and they're mm -hmm. into crypto, you know, uh, you know, digital, whatever, distributed ledger technology, all this, you know, all this bullshit. And I'm like, really? Well, uh, why don't we look at Bitcoin? What kind of properties does, should money have? And doesn't mm. Bitcoin have all the monetary properties we could ever dream dream of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely um, it's got the base qualities that you would want of a a sound money. Now, obviously, it's we're we're still very early, right? It's it's a decade in um, the 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 market cap of the whole thing is still small enough where large buyers and sellers can obviously are going to fluctuate the price a lot. Um, it's, it's akin to something you would see out of a, a stock pre IPO before it, you know, before large amounts of capital move into it. It's, it's very volatile and many people are incapable of looking past the short term to see the general trend over the past decade. Um, you know, any, obviously you turn on CNBC and it's got like the last six months and you're like, if literally if you zoomed out to the last year you would see it still doubled um and so so it's not, it, so it's not only the climate climate hoax uh whatever science <laughs> like with a jockey stick you know where they live out yeah. like <laughs> okay, yeah sorry about yeah that. it's no it's it's but yeah like it's it's this um it's this high time preference mentality that that we've been kind of taught but when you look at some of the qualities that that you want out of a sound money is is one that's very important to me is is that you want to be able to audit it you want to be able to constantly audit it and i'm a firm believer that the lack of easy audit auditability is what led to the demise of the gold standard because i mean at one time we did have we did have sound money um in, in gold and then uh through a, a mix of complacency and lack of auditability um people started entrusting uh, custodians uh, too much and and the custodians were able to represent the gold as as gold certificates and they were able to make more certificates than there were the difference was at least when the money was backed by gold when a custodian did that too much there'd be a bank run and they'd be they'd be wrecked um, but now that the money is backed by nothing it's literally backed by hopes and dreams <laughs> um, there's no there's no check on that and so okay great we can just make these certificates that are worthless paper as long as we want um and it doesn't matter if like in only in ex absolute extreme cases when there's no turning back like venezuela um is it does anything happen and so it's it's if you lose that auditability um that's where things can go sideways and so uh one of the one of the big debates over the past few years that resulted in forks and you know other shit coins saying hey look at us we can we can do transactions x transactions per second um was was the the block size how how much throughput do you have on the network how many how much data can you get through in x amount of time in bitcoin's case every 10 minutes and so it was one megabyte. We did a soft fork to kind of uh, massage the numbers and now we can get up uh, between two and, and uh, at, at a top kind of like close to four megabytes. Um, not that we've seen one that, that high yet, but uh, so the thing with that is you want to keep the base layer 
uh, accessible to all. And what I mean by that is you want somebody to be able to run a node and running a node simply means running an entire copy of the blockchain so that you can see the entire history of every single transaction ever, ever uh, created. And you are setting your own rules saying like, hey, this is the underlying rule set, like a 21 million cap. Um, and so you are, are basically saying, no matter what happens, these are the rules I'm abiding by and I'm auditing the chain at all times. And so in running a node and making sure that your wallets are referring to your own node, you don't push that responsibility to anybody else. You're doing it yourself. And imagine if, imagine if during the times of the gold standard, at all times, any person anywhere could get a window into any bank that was holding gold and fully audit that their certificate was connected to a specific piece of gold and no one else. Um, it, you wouldn't have had uh, this gradual shift towards uh, fractional reserve. You wouldn't have had, uh, you know, all the shady stuff that was happening before Nixon uh, suspended the gold standard. Uh, you wouldn't have had that gradual fall from because the second anything fishy happened, somebody would have said, well, I'm, I'm not going to partake in the system. I'm going to hold my own money. Um, so I think that's very important. And I think that's one of the strengths of Bitcoin was the foresight to ensure that we make it as easy as possible for people to, to audit. Um, and I think that's going to be one of the, one of the, the strengths moving forward because a, a lot of other chains have not have not focused on that at all. Oddly enough, um, it seems like everybody else has just completely disavowed that and thrown out the, out the window. Everybody for so long has been, oh, we got to do transactions per second. We got to shove everything on the base layer and add all these functions. And with that made it impossible for the people to execute the very function which Bitcoin was created for, which blows my mind. Um, but hey, less competition. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Um, ben, do you see um, with all these products, for example, you know, whatever that is, bid refill, like uh, all these other uh, uh, names you mentioned, like Lolly and Fold and, and, and so many others, do you see like uh, slowly, but gradually and all, all at once, maybe suddenly uh, <laughs> a circle like economy arising in different like clusters of markets everywhere? Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's going to happen. Uh, I, I think it's going to be the inverse of the way people originally attacked the issue. So early on you saw, we've got to get more merchants to adopt this. Um, I don't think that's going to be the direction that it goes. I think that, uh, <laughs> I think it's going to be when merchants themselves realize the value of Bitcoin and they start saying, I don't want to accept anything else but Bitcoin. That's when we see a circular economy because mm -hmm. all of a sudden, like if, if somebody's saying, I'm going to accept, I'm going to accept dollars and Bitcoin uh, and somebody who doesn't use Bitcoin sees that they accept it. They're not going to go, Oh, I better go out and buy some Bitcoin so that I can use it to purchase at the store when I already have dollars. But, if somebody, if a merchant has a great product or service that somebody really wants and they go to them and they say, sure, it's going to cost you this much Bitcoin. And somebody says, I don't, I don't, I don't have any Bitcoin. And they say, okay, we'll get lost. <laughs> like you can't have the product because I don't want your dollars. Or perhaps somebody, what I'd like to see is the inverse of BitPay. I'd like to see accept dollars, instant conversion to Bitcoin. That's oh. where I think mm -hmm. we start to get circular mm -hmm. economies. That's where I think when people start saying, I want the good money, I don't want you to pay me with the trash. You can keep that yourself or I'll let somebody else accept the dollars on my behalf and I want, I want the Bitcoin, send it to me. Um, when we start to see that, and by the way, if somebody knows of a payment processor that does that inverse, that does accepting dollars, paying out Bitcoin, like on the fly immediately, let me know. Cause I want Whoa. it. 
Yeah. Wow. That's that's it. Now sp let's spin it a little bit further because that's uh, you know we talk about often you know the driving force is the price. You know, like mm -hmm. people are like looking like up and down. Volatile. Of course, is volatility. Volatility is a you know is the is the mechanism for price discovery. It, you know, we mm -hmm. we need actually volatility for this whole process. Uh, for this monetary evolution, but you know, let's just you know break this down really, like really primitively. Isn't it about purchasing power? You know, I always say, what if the what if a kid you know could go today with one single satoshi? Let's just assume you know a satoshi could buy whatever uh, a toy, you know, something like mm -hmm. that, and then in a year or two or three, with that same single satoshi, you can buy you know two or three toys. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what if that is on top of that, you know, as a cherry on top of that circle economy and people for the first time, they know what it's like to have the scarcest money ever created in human history in your hand or in your control. And you can mm -hmm. buy more and more things with less and less Satoshis. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's exactly that's, that's the root of, of why this exists. It's um, I mean, in my lifetime, I've, I've never, so I'm 34 right now. I've never lived in a time where money was backed by gold. I've always been subject to, and, and I'm lucky because I'm in Canada and, and I'm, it's better than certain parts of the world, but I've always been subject to inflation all the time. And not I even our parents have been, not even our parents or grandparents, to be honest with you, right? I mean, when did yeah. they detach? gold uh you know from uh, uh when did they detach it it was like wasn't it like sh shortly before 1914 actually starting to you know world you know yeah. financing wars like yeah yeah it's it's been very because like 70 71 was the official nixon yeah. saying like hey you can't convert but i mean there there was tricky things going on before then it was it was a road to get there but um but yeah it's it's to have the inverse as from from a young age to to learn because we've always i've grown up well okay this is going to be more expensive over time and even though you maybe as a kid don't quite understand what's going on and why um it does get ingrained in your head that that Oh, you, you should, you know, you can spend your money, you could save it, but you might not get as much later. Um, and so over time, it's, it's like this culture of, of consumerism again. Um, but as, as a kid, if you, even to have the contrast, like, let's say, so my, my daughter's two, she's, but she's too young, obviously yet to, to really understand that. But when she starts to get allowance, you better bet I'm going to be splitting it half and half. I'll say here. Okay. You'll, you'll get some allowance. You can spend some, but also we're going to put some in savings. We're going to, we're going to, you're going to have a little bit of some dollars and, and some Bitcoin and same amount every time we'll go into each, but I want you to pay attention to what happens over, you know, and, and, you know, it'll be like, we're going to save up for the next little bit. And then, and then you get to buy whatever thing you want. Uh, and so I just want her to over the years, pay attention to what happens with the purchasing power of something that can be created non-stop um and that you she has no control over any aspect of it um and then something that is is finite and and even though she very early on may not understand why it's happening it'll get her asking those questions at an early age and hopefully it'll be a good life lesson <laughs> we'll we'll see but i i think having a generation of kids like that where they grow up saying like well i could buy this now but if i wait the value of my money will gradually appreciate and i'll be able to get more and so they start thinking not immediately in the present but okay maybe i'll have a balance of that maybe i'll i can spend a little bit now but put something away for savings and it brings back that want and that desire to save and to plan for the future which i don't think we have right now um it'd be very interesting to see and i mean it's it, on a, on a level of like an adult uh you you you're forced instead of just simply saving your money as you would have you know in years prior you're literally forced into a a, a situation where 
you need to essentially roll the dice and gamble just in the hopes that you will outpace inflation and and be able to retire. Uh, so you're, you're 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 literally forced into gambling just to retire because if you just save your money, you're screwed. That that two percent stated inflation is going to get you. <laughs> You have a pretty interesting, fascinating background. You're an, uh, you're originally like an artist, right? Uh, looked at your yeah. some of your pictures. You're you're what an artist singer? Uh, you're a dance instructor. Yes. So I was uh, uh, for a decade. I worked with a company uh, that was in school residencies, and I taught little kids how to break dance. And so, um, and I mean, I've done other stuff. I've, I've performed, I've performed on cruise ships. I sing in an acapella group. I've done okay. a lot of that stuff for, for years and years. Um, and so it sounds like an odd transition going from teaching break dancing to like Bitcoin, but oddly enough, like teaching complex dance movements to school age children is, is very similar to teaching, okay. yeah. you know, complex technology to adults. It's just a matter of, if you understand the material and you're able to break it down to the lowest common denominator, then, then yeah, that's, it's, it's more just an, a, a question of, can you, can you teach something that you yourself understand? And so, right. uh, that, that's kind of, like, God, I, I'd love to be in this space full time, but how am I going to do it? And then I think I just kind of put two together. Well, I've, I've, I have been educating people just on a totally different topic. Maybe that can be my transition and that's just the path that led me down. And here I am. And, and you know what, uh, that's, that's really a, a brilliant talent uh, you have then, because it means Thanks. if you can put yourself into the shoes of a seven year old, eight year old child, an adult can understand it finally. And this is, mm -hmm. the, you know, this is the bridge. I think this is the challenge of times because, you know, people have way too much high expectations when explaining things, you know, yeah. like prerequisite of technical intellectual knowledge, you know, and I always mm -hmm. start with myself, you know, I'm not technical. I mean, you know, I'd rather really have a plug and play simple things. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, uh, it's like nowadays, you know, with a computer or internet compared to whatever, 20, 30 years ago or whatever, yeah. you know? Um, so, um, have you been t teaching actually in schools? Cause I can imagine you, you would, you would make a perfect role for this, you know, like going to schools and teaching whatever, whether they're seven or 14 years old and teaching them yeah. the essence of money. I I've, I've not taught in that capacity for this subject matter. Um, I think it would be a lot of fun. Uh, I would have to, again, like it would take some, some good planning. It's, it's always different um depending on who you're talking to right you've got to you've got to make sure that you're kind of catering to the entire room which the larger the room the more difficult that is um one on one super easy because you can hone in on what doesn't make sense to somebody but um yeah like uh, i think it's valuable to do something like that uh, now whether or not schools are even interested in doing that yet uh <laughs> are as a whole other question um, but yeah, like one of the things that I would very much like to do is, is hold kind of in-person beginner workshops of just learning the basics. The thing is, it's a very, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you're well aware it's, it's a very bipolar market for something like that. You know, when, when you get through into the depths of a bear market, not a lot of people, a lot, not a lot of new people are coming around to learn the basics. Uh, and so that's, it's something where maybe, maybe in, in years, in a, a decade from now, it'll be like a full on profession to go into schools and talk about this stuff. Um, but right now, uh, you get, you got to kind of be, yeah, a little bit more entrepreneurial about it. Um, I guess that's, that's partly the reason for the channel. Uh, is to get people onboarded that way, um, and I think I should probably do a new round of basic tutorials for for you know pre having here kind of <laughs> future proof myself for the next few years. But yeah, it's I I think it's uh, I think it's a great idea to to have that available to people.
Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking right now at your uh, website. Really looks, uh, you know, like really neat and and clean. <laughs> like it's, like really it's got to be simplified. simple. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. This is this is the art of it. This is the art of education. And yeah, this is your Twitter handle. So mm -hmm. um, let me let me ask you. Um, do you have the feeling in Canada? Because you know, I mean, Austria is a small country. People are still, you know, very, uh, you know, as many other countries are like. Uh, and it's been confirmed by other Bitcoiners. It's like really narrow-minded still and conservative <laughs> and close-minded. Do you have the feeling in Canada people are much more, or, or you know, compared to other, uh, they're more um, curious, open-minded, or, or receptive? Yeah, um, it's 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 odd. Uh, I I thought that. Because uh, I, I live in Calgary, uh, in Alberta, and Alberta is known to be pretty conservative-minded. Um, oddly enough, I found that Albertans are are quite open and curious about this kind of stuff. Because also, I guess, it, it, and I don't know why this is, but conservatism also tends to lean towards an appreciation of like sound money and 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 being smart with monetary policies and, and, and how you allocate funds. And so I'm not sure why it's one or the other, but um, I remember going to Vancouver when I was working for a, a company and we did, um, we had a booth at like a festival. We did the same thing in Calgary and Vancouver and people could come up and ask about Bitcoin and, and learn. And we'd kind of, teach on the spot and then we're also like an onboarding platform and the number of people that came up and were genuinely curious in calgary surprisingly far exceeded those in vancouver it was pretty pretty um st i i got a lot more sneers and and like uh, just people thinking that it was trash as they walked by in Vancouver and now I shouldn't say it like it's not, it wasn't a blanket statement there, but um, it was a lot more cynical. I found mm -hmm. there oddly enough. So I think it just depends on, on where you're at. Canada as a whole, I think has been pretty receptive to Bitcoin. Um, Andreas talked to our Senate, Andreas Antonov. Yeah. On, yeah. I yeah, see. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. Great yeah. So he was here in 2014, very early on, he recommended kind of like a hands-off approach for the next five years, which they very much did. Um, and then even still like the regulations that are coming in, down the pipeline in Canada are, I mean, they, they could be better, but they're really not, they're really not bad. Like it's, it's kind of like basic uh, anti-money laundering stuff that is applicable everywhere. Just, I'd say, slightly tighter uh but still really not not horrendous it could have been much worse um so yeah i think canada as a whole is pretty receptive to it i know they've done studies where at one i think at one point out of the people they surveyed like five percent of them said they had at one point owned bitcoin or some some type of cryptocurrency well, not bad no. uh, <laughs> yeah which is which is like uh, if people have dabbled uh that's for sure so at least they're they're starting to go down that rabbit hole um so yeah i i'm i'm very hopeful that canada will be a good place for bitcoiners to be uh over the coming decades <laughs> ben do you have the feeling people do not understand the serious situation we are in right now like Oh, macroeconomically, yeah. geopolitically, like ever, a negative interest rate now in the G first German banks on retail mm -hmm. accounts, like deposit and saving accounts. We got Lagarde, yeah. who's actually been whatever, actually had been convicted even of, you know, I mean, we're pe we have people inside the system that are totally immune, uh, legally immune to, you know, whatever action decision they make, you know, it's, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So do, do you think like what is stopping people from comprehending the seriousness of our situation like for themselves. I, I think it's, it's just, it's indifference. People, until it's completely broken for them, mm. they don't have the foresight to care. Um, you know, you saw it before with the Cypriot break, banking crisis. You saw it in Greece when, when everything was essentially shut down. You couldn't withdraw more than 60 euros a day. 
when uh, when shit hits the fan like that yeah Mm -hmm. like it's well yeah and currently like italy and greece are now talking about uh cash about limit how, like whatever yeah. like yeah. yeah like i think italy next year any and you can't do cash purchases over two thousand euros it'll be illegal and a year later it's only a thousand euros mm-hmm. and meanwhile greece you have to spend you're gonna have to spend one third of your income via electronic means and if you don't then there's going to be 22 percent like fine or something yeah, it's yeah, 22 percent fine oh or tax they're calling it on on anything that is isn't sorry anything that you don't spend out of the one-third of your income electronically and so it it there's there's like this war on cash and so the people that are there mm-hmm. they start to recognize the, the problems and the value proposition of something like bitcoin but the thing is when you're in that situation when you're when you're in greece and you can only go and get 60 euros per day it would be great to have bitcoin but at that point you're you've got to get food. You've got to pay your bills. And so it's too late at that point. Um, and, and I mean, that's kind of what we saw. Like there, there was, when that was happening in Greece, there was a boost to the price of Bitcoin at the time, but it, it, it by and large probably wasn't coming from people in Greece. It was people in and around Greece that were looking next door going, Oh God, maybe, maybe I should, grab some bitcoin and mm. i think it was a general sentiment from the people already in bitcoin going like i'm gonna stack a little bit more because that's scary uh so yeah i i think as as much as it pains me to say i think a lot of people that need bitcoin the most won't have it until it's too late um and then they'll be relying on gray markets to get it and 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 i mean it the lucky thing is is I guess it's it's kind of never too late to to use Bitcoin, but it would sure be nice to have some in advance of a situation like that, um, because when you really need it, it'll it'll be more difficult and more expensive to obtain it. Right, right. Um, excellent, uh, Ben. Any other um, future, like optimistic future uh, uh, scenarios? Like, uh, what, 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 where do you see we are going? Like in the next few years, not like you know in terms of price, but like um, for example, let me give you a concrete example. I talked to uh, Randy Brito from Locha Mesh, a great, great guy. I mean, this great project. It's open source, everything, the hardware, the software. So we talked about you know Venezuela, Iran. You know, after all these protests in Iran, so I'm like, what if we had you know like a compact kit which would make you totally independent of the internet i'm like if Mm -hmm. we can onboard these people in venezuela like in countries with hyper inflation where you know where people are really suffering they really need it you know do you think that would like accelerate the process of critical adoption rate everywhere else i yeah i i think a lot of these technologies proliferate when there's an absolute need for them Mm -hmm. um so this, I mean, it's a positive and a negative because I think a lot of stuff doesn't happen until shit really hits the fan. Like when, when did, when did Bitcoin actually start? Well, it was like in direct, it, it was obviously a direct uh, response to, to the banking crisis, to the, to the um, 2008, um, you know, it launched January 3rd, 2009. And so, you know, it, it was, you can see in the white paper and the way that it launched and like the, the hard coded message into the, the first blog, you can see the, the intentions there. Um, but it took until that point to create it. Obviously there's a lot of legwork before then there were technologies that assisted Bitcoin in being able to be created in the first place. But, um, it does take time for people to realize the value of something. Um, and so I, I am hopeful. I'm, I, you know, you see things like um, Hong Kong, and I'm talking previously when there were protests in Hong Kong and people were using mesh networks to communicate and organize protests. You see things like these start to pop up when there's a need, um, and it's unfortunate that that it has to get that far before they become available or be, before people really start to utilize them. But that in my eyes, that is how it tends to work. And so as we go down this route of negative interest rates, 
as we go down this route of, of forcing people into digital money that is custodial, um, then non-custodial digital fine, you know, finite money it will become necessary. And same thing as countries start to uh, try to crack down on things and perhaps cut off internet. Well, then you'll see things like mesh networks pop up and other ways to communicate. Um, and so I'm, I'm optimistic, but I also recognize that dire cir circumstances lead to these uh, liberating new technologies. Uh, so, you know, hopefully the negative is minimized and people can jump onto these new things quickly. And I think that may be the case uh, because people are very resourceful and, and access to technology is becoming easier and easier. But I guess, I guess we'll see. And I, and it, it, I know you said not price, but uh, the other thing that I think is going to be interesting is we're it's the third having next year. Yeah. And uh, I'm not saying that, that history will necessarily repeat itself exactly, but historically speaking, having in 2012, 2013 was a total mania. Having in 2016, 2017 was a total mania. Mm -hmm. I think that pinch, that that pinch on the supply, the market is used to absorbing a certain amount of new Bitcoin and gets very used to it over the course of four years. And then that gets cut down. And over the, the year following, that pinch is gradually felt and Bitcoin kind of rises to the level that equilibrium. But as soon as it does, as soon as it starts to peak around that, those previous highs, that's when the mainstream media picks up. So oh, new all time high. And then Johnny retail investor just piles into everything. And then when Bitcoin looks too expensive, the manias for the, the shit coins start up. And I, I, I think we're going to be seeing a few more of those cycles because clearly not everybody is privy to this stuff yet um but it's i i think bitcoin was kind of designed that way uh because every time there's a mania and people drop off in the bear market a good chunk of people stick around and they start to ask the good questions they start to get educated and those people become the educators of the next wave uh and i i i very much think that was by design and we'll see if it plays out again this time. Exactly, and, and this is where the, you know this the, 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 these huge you know bigger numbers of of, of hardless of last resort are born. And uh, mm -hmm. what I was also going to say is that yeah, you're right. Out of this necessity or pain points and suffering and needs comes then you know the manifestation of all these technologies and being critically adopted. And um, yeah, uh, so um, anyway. Um, Thank you so much, Ben. It was I really enjoyed our talk. Um, um, your your website is btsessions.ca. I can only recommend to all my listeners and viewers, you know, to check out even your, also your your YouTube channel. Is it uh, BTC Sessions? Yep, just BTC Sessions. BTC you sessions. can search that on YouTube and find it easy. And same Twitter handle, BTC Sessions. Yeah, put it put it all in the show notes. So uh, thank you so much. Ben and I hope to you know get you back on. I, I'd really love to you know see you again, maybe face to face, do this maybe in in person. Uh, who yeah, knows? we're yeah. gonna see each other next time. Yeah, thanks for Bye. having me. All right, Ben, have a good day. Bye. Hey, this is your total connector again. Uh, so what do you guys think? Um, I was really blasted away by this um, talk interview with Ben Perrin of BTC Sessions. Um, it was really uh, fascinating to go down the rabbit hole with him, you know, when it comes to the essence, uh, the understanding, uh, you know, why Bitcoin, uh, what are the, you know, what do people really, most people understand when it comes to Bitcoin, what are the fears, the biases, their, their comprehension level, their misconceptions. So it was really fascinating to talk to him. Hope you loved it as much as I did. Let me know your questions, your feedback. We really appreciate, you know, any kind of positive review. If you liked it, share, subscribe, follow me. And I would really appreciate a positive review on Apple iTunes and any, any other podcast platform or what have you. So, yeah, let me know your questions and your feedback. Thank you so much for your support, for listening. And uh, make sure you follow Ben Perrin on YouTube and on Twitter. I'm going to put those in the show notes. And also, you know, uh, follow me on uh, any other social media platforms, would it be Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Telegram, 
and what have you. Um, all right. So hope hope you loved it and talk to you soon again. Thank you so much.